You're listening to Trek FM. Want to join in the conversation and share your thoughts on this episode? Join the Babel Conference, our listeners' discussion group on Facebook. Just type B-A-B-E-L into the Facebook search field, and we look forward to seeing you there. This is Steve Sansweet of Rancho Obi-Wan, and you're listening to the 602 Club. There was a little bar in Mill Valley where all the Starfleet trainees used to go. The 602 Club. You know it. <laughs> I was there more times than I can remember. Were you spying on me? Me? Spy? Never. Look, this is all going to come at you pretty fast, so listen up. That intel you gave us, that was a message from a secret source. It confirms what we've been afraid of. The First Order is planning a full-scale attack on the New Republic. Then we have to do something. We have to stop them! My orders are to find out where that attack is going to come from and when. And I'm going to help. Whatever the job is that you give the ace pilots. You know, the ace pilot job. Can you believe this kid, BB-8? Yeah, he believes me. BB-8 knows the Resistance needs Kazuta Ziono. Please, Poe. I've got whatever that thing is. I mean, you said it yourself. And I grew up in the New Republic. It's my home. It's everything I know. I want the chance to fight for it. <laughs> okay, Kazuda Ziono. You want in, you're in. I've got a mission for you. Yes! All right. Hello and welcome to the 602 Club, Trek FM's local watering hole and general geek show. I'm so excited to be here tonight. Um, we're a little bit late this week, but you know what? In like a week nobody will care because this show will just be one of the feed so um i'm so excited though that um we're gonna get a show out to everybody uh it's always my goal to get people the show and um i just want to say a huge thank you to uh you know everybody out there who listens so uh find us everywhere wherever you get your podcasts of course we are over on apple podcasts at itunes.com slash trek fm you can find all the shows we do while you're there help us out Find us, the 602 Club, give us a star rating and review, let everybody know what you think of the show. Um, you know, there are a lot of shows out there like this, and so I appreciate you listening, and, and if you like it, let other people know. Give, them that, give us that star rating review, and uh, you can also find us and, and help out the entire network by following us on Twitter, at TrekFM, where you can follow us uh, and like us over on Facebook at facebook.com slash TrekFM. That's a great way to keep up with the shows that are coming out from the network. We have so many shows, so make sure you're checking them all out. You've got the website at trek.fm, which is a great place to go because... You can also find uh, a good place to send us an email over at trek.fm slash contact. Choose a show, choose the 602 Club, and that comes to me and any host that's on that week. And last but not least, we've got the Listeners Only Discussion Group. You can talk about Trek FM shows with all of the people from around the world who love our shows. And the best way to do that is go to Facebook, type Babel into the search field, and you'll find the Babel Conference, which is our listeners-only discussion group, as I said. Uh, and then, you know, if you're on the website perusing all the different shows, any of those show pages, there's a little button that says Discussion, and that would bring you over there as well. So, really glad to be here, because um, I've got with me the one and only... John Mills. And, uh, well, John, it's it's great to have you back in your uh, preordained seat here in the 602 Club. <laughs> well, you didn't need to add the ornamentation of... Uh of the uh, the the vampires at the top of the chair in honor of the month in which we're recording this, but I do appreciate it because I'm a big fan of Shocktober. Well, you know, I, I mean, it's October. I know how you like your Shocktober, and Ruby just thought she'd do something nice for well, you. Well, I like it because it, it also gets us ready for uh, in a couple of weeks when we talk about Halloween. <laughs> it does. It does. You're absolutely right. Oh, gosh. Um, I keep trying to put that out of my mind that we're doing that, but uh, <laughs> this week we are... <laughs> <laughs> We're here to talk about something that's near and dear to both of our hearts, a little Star Wars, uh, because we had mm, something happen over on the Disney Channel. Brand new animated show just started, um, Star Wars Resistance. And, um, you know, one of the things to me, the, the, the setup for this one's fascinating. Um, one, we got confirmation that this is really just about six months before The Force Awakens. Mm hmm. So that's fascinating to me. So this is kind of going to be uh, more of a 
crossover than a prequel series. And on top of that, we really have, you know, uh, the, the Resistance is trying to uncover what is up with the First Order because they've heard rumors that the First Order is going to launch, launch a full-scale assault on the New Republic. And they're building a weapon as well. So they uh, have heard rumors that this base called Colossus um, is a, a kind of a hotbed of uh, First Order activity, which is it's also a base that's kind of on the edge of wild space, um, and it's an operations, it's a, it's a field depot, basically. Mm-hmm. Um, and lots of, you know, pirates and, and uh, you know, uh, ex-rebellion, ex-imperial pilots all uh, are there. Uh, it kind of feels like... It, to me, that it almost felt a little bit like Deep Space Nine. Oh, that's an interesting comparison. I think I I can see that. I can add, that did not occur to me uh, right off the bat. But I think you're right. It is. It's like a neutral ground where all of these different mm-hmm. uh, yeah. people from different backgrounds and philosophies are sort of forced to have a detente. They don't. They don't necessarily get along, but there's no truly open hostility at this point. So I I like that. That's a really good comparison. Yeah. Well, and then, I mean, you have the, the bar that's there, yeah. uh, Mama Z's bar, and it kind of feels a little bit like Quark's, you know, you kind of have the, uh, you have the dart board there, you know, oh, which I true. thought was interesting. Uh, you've even got a jukebox, which I thought was funny. Um, you know, I, I, I don't, uh, I don't, I, you, do you play a little sliced noodles on there or, you know? Well, yeah. um, <laughs> well that would be a class. <laughs> that would, like sliced noodles, Max Rebo Band would be like is classic. It, yeah, isn't it like, yeah, that's like in Star Trek when he's playing, you know, uh, the Beastie Boys. Right. So. Yeah, that's it. Yeah, <laughs> I, I can see that. That works. That works. Uh, well, I, I mean, and and who knows? Um, uh, the modal nodes could be on there as well. <laughs> so with their greatest hits. Oh yeah, so. but they would be more of a. Well, no, they're contemporaneous. Sure. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, they're more. I mean, they they would be more in the the classical jazz standards, though, for the galaxy. I think so. <laughs> yeah, they're. They, yeah. <laughs> See, the thing is, you can just run with that and get a little out of control. Because now I'm thinking, I'm like, so is are they are they like uh, Glenn Miller and Max Rebo is like Kenny G? But I don't want to call him Kenny G. <laughs> but Drew being a cool, you know, flute sort of looks like that. So, you know. Oh man! See that? Oh well, and that, and okay. Not only that, but I noticed while rewatching the, uh, especially the first episode again, um, there are like video games mm-hmm. in the corner as well. Yeah, I'm like what they 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 do they play like the is it like the Falcon game? Is that it? but if it's asteroids with the Falcon? Oh, and, oh what about like a? You know, uh, oh, you could play. Um... Instead of snake, it's space slug. Yeah, yeah, no, but like a find the Falcon game, like each each level, like you're you're trying to find the mythical Millennium Falcon that's been lost for all of the, because by this point, since it's only <laughs> that's six, true, yeah, it, it's yeah. been gone for a long time. Is it with the Duquesne boys? Right. You know, the Irving brothers. I mean, who's got it? Um, yeah, no. I, so all that to say, it, we we are in such a fascinating time period. And the, you know the the fir- they they put out three episodes. The first episode is actually two episodes put together mm-hmm. to make like almost a, like a little mini movie. And you know you have this this character uh, Kaz, who is a pilot for the New Republic, and he is on a mission from the New Republic to pass intelligence to the Resistance. So we get a little bit of a picture of the way in which people view the resistance, which I thought was fascinating. There is this tenuous link between them, and yet, like what we hear from Kaz's father, he calls them extremists. Right, right. And so, to me, this is what makes the setup so fascinating, because I think both you and I, one of the things we've wanted so much is to have that setup. What is this galaxy really like at this time period, and how do all these pieces fit together before... You know, you kind of blow it all to hell, honestly, in uh, the the Force Awakens, right? Where everything's blown up. You know, for Star Killer Base, yeah. the New Republic, everything's gone. But before that, you know, you kind of want to know w- what all these pieces on the board were. You know, and and that's something that I think that uh, 
there is a definite split in the fan base at times between people who want more detail like this and people who view it as unnecessary. And what I would say is that the, the real opportunity for this show, and it seems from these first episodes that they're embracing it, is to give a better idea of why The Force Awakens seems to be occurring at the end of an era. Right? Like, we see the beginning of the era with Return of the Jedi. We see the end of the era with The Force Awakens. It's sort of the way Attack of the Clones and Revenge of the Sith happen. We see the beginning of the war, we see the end of the war, and then there's nothing in between between the films. Um, So I see an opportunity here to provide some shading. And I think that, I, I honestly, it seems that the impulse here is that they are going to do that, that they're going to respond to that desire, uh, you know, to, to have more, uh, more intrigue uh, going on. Like, the fact that Kaz's father does refer to them as extremists, that's a very specific word to throw out there. We've gotten from ancillary materials that the Republic doesn't directly support the Resistance, that they're not nuts about the Resistance, that... There's more going on inside the Republic that's sort of causing problems that distract them from the First Order. So this is our first indication that there are people in power in the Republic who view the Resistance with disdain. They don't want it there at all. So you see, actually, just in that simple exchange, that additionally, the conflict layer within the New Republic itself where you have people that are fine with indirectly supporting it. We have the resistance itself, and then we have people who hate the resistance. Well, why can't they get rid of it, and what type of power struggle is going on there that's causing that split? And that's the sort of thing that I really like in a show like this, because it's not much dialogue, but it's enough to get me start wondering and become more invested in this time period. Well, and one of the things that I really liked, too, is that you add on top of all of that Yeager's uh, thought process, you know, when he's talking to Poe and he's like, Poe is like, aren't you worried about the First Order? You know, we know that they're really bad, basically. We know something's going on. And he's like, look, the Empire is gone. I don't want anything to do with any of this. And so you also have those people who... They, they've kind of been through the ringer with the war and the cleanup from that war with the Civil War with the Empire, and they don't, they don't want there to be another fight. Basically, it, it really does feel a lot like, you know, Yiga reminds me of the guy who was in World War I, and the last thing he wants is World War II. Yes. And so you really, I, I think, again, like you were saying, just the little tiny bits of dialogue, especially in that first episode where we're getting this set up, I think was done really well. They found a great way to give you just enough of a kernel to allow your mind to explode and the ideas. And then on top of that, uh, the first couple of episodes actually end with us seeing a little bit about what's going on in the First Order, Mm -hmm. which was also nice because you're seeing that set up. You're seeing that they are working on completing the Starkiller base. You know, they are working on trying to infiltrate uh, the the Resistance and the Republic, getting information, um, obviously having a connection with the Colossus here, and uh, it, it seems like they may be looking for resources from the Colossus and that planet that they're on. And... Uh, the the whole goal seems to be to be able to maybe take that, basically annex that planet into First Order territory mm-hmm. at that point. And the scary part of, you know, like you said, you've got this, this Republic, these Republic factions that are not willing to see the threat that's there. Mm-hmm. Um, and I think, you know, we, we, we've known from those ancillary materials that this is the case, that there is this split, that there is this group who kind of sees the First Order as either a phantom menace or not a menace at all or, um, you know, something that they don't even need to worry about. They're too far away. It doesn't matter, Mm -hmm. you know. uh, And and I, I really like the way this show 
is setting itself up. And it does make me wonder, you know, I, I had this question because I was wondering this. So if we're only six months before The Force Awakens, do you think this show is maybe possibly just a two-season show? 22 episodes each? I and- think that they could have built in uh, that as an escape valve. I don't think that fewer than 50 episodes benefits them in terms of uh, mind space and fan buy-in. I think that given the momentum that we have here in these first three episodes, they have an opportunity if it if it keeps building on this momentum and, and going the way that I think it's going to go, they have an opportunity here to actually continue as the show of stuff that's happening while we're paying attention to the movies, which I think is very yeah. exciting mm-hmm. because then you can answer quest. You can basically use this show as a release valve so that when people have story questions that they think weren't answered to their satisfaction in the movies, they know they're going to be able to come to this show and find what's going on there. Well, and I think you're really onto something because as you were saying that, I was thinking to myself, well, The Last Jedi happens right after The Force Mm -hmm. Awakens, a few days. And then there is most likely going to be some kind of time period between eight and nine. I mean, and and the speculation is anywhere from a few years to maybe longer. Mm -hmm. So this could definitely be the show that fills in those gaps because you're just, you move through those two films. You can add, you know, kind of what was going on during the, the last Jedi and then at right after that. And you could really use that to continue to fill in. And especially if they're going to bring in the actors. I mean, you got, uh, you know, Poe Dameron uh, and Oscar Isaac in the show. So there's no reason to not be able to do that. Maybe, after you get done with nine. And and so this first season, you know, and the second season could play out before you get to, you know, where it connects with The Force Awakens and then nine is out and then you can do whatever you want. How cool so. would it be to see the perspective on the destruction of the Republic from an outpost like this? What's the impact going to be on the power balance of the people that are sharing space there where suddenly the the criminal elements and the First Order sympathizers are going to feel a heck of a lot more emboldened when something like that happens. And so you can, you'll, they'll be able to demonstrate the power shift in that moment from the perspective of people that aren't main characters. And to your point about how we already have Oscar Isaac in here, if they keep it going, they can, they, they can pull anybody. They could even pull Daisy Ridley in or, or, or John uh, Boyega yeah. or anybody else. Yep. I mean, they, they've got... I was actually surprised and delighted to see Phasma in this because one of my most frustrating points with things is that I think that they did a great job of I mean that Phasma book by Delilah Dawson was great Um, Mm -hmm. I I think that the Phasma comic was great I've come to really both excellent really like Phasma as a character but I don't get enough of her in the movies by a long shot so to have Mm, phasma show up and have gwendolyn christie do her voice i was thrilled i was so happy i was like oh good i'm getting more more of one of the side characters that i think got short shrift yeah no i completely agree with you and and you're absolutely right i mean you could have i mean they've already had daisy ridley do um you know the force of destiny Mm -hmm. Uh, John Boyega has also been in that as well. So, you know, it, these people don't seem to be um, outside the realm of possibility to bring in later on to do things like that. And uh, I think it's it's a phenomenal opportunity then to, in many ways, you know, that Resistance could become the Clone Wars of this era that yeah. really helps uh, expand uh, what we know and bring it together in a way that it really, you know... Um, I don't it makes some things much more palatable. Even like you said, you've got Captain Phasma, who is a character who's been completely wasted, you know, super cool, but has had, I mean, it, she's literally the Boba Fett of this series, uh, uh, of this sequel trilogy, you, you know. You know. <laughs> yeah, I, I mean, uh, it's, it, it, it has been frustrating, especially because her, I mean, her armor design is in fact very cool. And, um, you know, speaking of of her armor design, I, I know I might be be jumping here, but another impulse that the movies have not 
adequately answered for me is we all know I have a passion for ship designs. You, I know you do too. I know a lot of us have passions yeah. for ship designs. And just in the first few episodes here, I've gotten to see a different type of TIE fighter where, you know, my little ping. Oh, if that's a toy that might have to be added to the collection and seeing like a Red Baron type, I'm like, I love me some cool armor as well. And so seeing this Red Baron type of character uh, in there and the racing ships that they have, uh, like I, I just, I see so many things that appeal to me as a longtime fan being uh, played out here in this show. And even I, you know, you called out some of the um, wonderful call outs that, that, that line up with Deep Space Nine. Uh, the racing rings made me think of Star Fox on N64. Yes. <laughs> like yes. I, the first time I saw them, it I was like, like yes. Star Fox. Yeah, right. So that that's a, another. You're absolutely right. Gosh, I can't believe I didn't. Yeah, do it's that. a great little call out. I was never very good at that game. So. I, I wasn't yeah. either, but I couldn't stop playing. <laughs> Yeah, I mean, back in the day, it was so cool. Um, if if you don't know what Star Fox oh, is, yeah. kids, just Google it. I'm uh, sure there's a YouTube so, video of somebody playing it out there. <laughs> there's yeah. got to be one of somebody who's just awesome. Yeah. Have you ever like watched YouTube videos of your like favorite game and you see somebody play it who's just like insane at it? Like, yes. And it it just makes your heart hurt. You're like, I was never that right. Guy. Yeah, yeah. You feel like Salieri <laughs> in that moment. Why? Why did Mozart get this yes. skill? Yeah. 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 Or I was kind of thinking of the, the you know, uh, the battle droid that falls uh, when <laughs> when Asajj pushes yeah. it off, and he's like, "Why?" <laughs> yes. Yes. Oh. <laughs> uh, anyway, um, we should jump into characters because there's there's quite a few to talk about, and uh, you know, obviously Kaz is our main character, and so I'm really interested to see what your thoughts are on him because obviously he's a good pilot we saw his piloting skills uh in the new republic x-wing which was really cool we got to see i think it's the uh new republic x-wing it's like the x80 Mm -hmm. um whereas the one like poe flies i think is and and fans you you can tell me if i'm wrong but i think it's the x75 maybe um so uh, anyway hit the the resistance x-wings i know are older the, these are the New Republic ones, and they're actually the newer X-Wings. Um, so that was really cool to see, and we do see that him being a fantastic pilot. Um, but, you know, I, I don't know. I, what do you think of him as a, as a character here at the very beginning with these first three episodes? I I like the character for the potential that I see, the arc that I see developing. Um, and I think back to my initial reaction to Ezra in Rebels was a little bit standoffish. I was like, ah, I don't know. I got to see what you're going to do with this guy. And then I saw what they did with that guy. And I said, oh, okay. Yeah. Great character. Love him to death. I see a similar opportunity here. And I think with Kaz as well, the I, I really tried to watch these episodes with, and especially pay attention to the characters about was the lesson I learned from rebels because rebels, mm-hmm. I pushed away immediately in that very beginning and I had to warm up to it and I'm not going to make that mistake this time and instead I'm going to say Kaz I think is a character that has a lot of potential and I think he's starting off in a good place yeah um I I am going to correct myself for everyone who just wondered uh (laughs) it they are actually um the uh T-85s. Uh, that's the X-Wings that they're flying uh, at the beginning, the New Republic X-Wings. Oh, the yeah. ones you no, saw that does and, make and, sense and, because and, Luke was a T-65, yeah. right? Yep, T-65. Um, so, yeah, very cool. Uh, I just, I love the upgrade. Um, and the resistance ones we see are the T-70s. So that's that's the answer to that. So I just uh, looked that up. So um, you don't have to send in your, your hate tweets. <laughs> I, I, I figured it out. Um, you know, I'm right there with you. I I I had to to watch this show with the eye towards what I experienced in Rebels, and especially having gone back to rewatch Rebels now as a full series uh, this last summer, they did a thing that you didn't expect uh, at the beginning, um, which was to be able to connect all these things and make them important later on. And it may even be a season later before something like really came into play, or it could be at the end of the series. And so. This show, I think, is definitely doing that. I think they're taking that with Kaz. 
I will say, for me, I think that this show maybe pushes it slightly too far with him. Kind of the um, bumbling, he's not good at anything kind of thing except for flying. Um, I think that, you know, I know it's a cartoon, but I do think they've kind of pushed it to a, a more cartoonish level that I'm used to even having seen Rebels. Mm. I think it's all going to rein itself in, but if I do have one criticism is that, honestly, Kaz is pretty annoying right now, Um, and I I think that's going to be part of the arc. I think the arc is going to be having a kid go from somebody who, you know, he grew up in a life where his dad did everything for him, and now he's having to learn what it means to do things on his own and actually earn it. And he's having a hard time learning that you have to earn what you want to do. You can't, you're, it's not just given to you. You know, yeah. you got to learn it. You got to do it. You got to grow into it. And I think that maturity in him is going to be the growth that we see of him going from kind of being somebody who had everything handed to him to being somebody who earns everything he gets, which is, I think, is a good arc, I hope. You know, it's interesting. I, um, I guess, I, I, I don't know why I don't fall on like i i guess when i hear you know the, the character is a little too far in your opinion in in one direction i think it pays off though because that bar fight scene i actually chuckled out loud and when he <laughs> he let the engine drift off and then the episode ends with the exact same thing if the character were a little more serious or serious minded i wouldn't buy that happening but the fact that he is like that, I buy that he's going to get distracted and the engine's going to just trail off right behind him and he's going to run after going, no, 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 no. You know, I, I think that's really cute. Yeah, and a real difference here too is that this is a character who, unlike Ezra, Ezra was really good at things because he had to do everything for himself. Kaz isn't good at anything yeah. because he's never had to do anything for himself, really, um, except for learn how to fly. And so I, I think, you know, this is is the journey of somebody learning to be a man, mm-hmm. you know, and but learning to make those things happen. And I think that is going to be a good arc. And I, I like you, I can see the potential of where they're going to go with it. I think for me personally, it's a little bit rockier to watch this part of the journey uh, just because it can be a little bit grating for me. Mm-hmm. But. I get what they're doing and I get where they're going to go and I'm willing to give it the benefit of the doubt so that hopefully as we move throughout even this season and then, you know, throughout the seasons, you know, we'll really be given something like we were in Rebels where it's, you, you really, once you go back, you really enjoy where you, where you end up and that, that's always neat, you know, that, and they definitely do that with their animated shows, so. Yeah. Um, I have to say though, the the character that one of the characters I liked the most was Tam. Oh yeah, I loved her as a character because she's totally no nonsense. I love you know that that um, British accent that she has, um, and she's just I I don't I really enjoyed her more serious. I I enjoyed her serious side, um, but at the same time, kind of you know being able to make fun of of Kaz whenever he, you know, gets into trouble and stuff. Um, I just really enjoyed her character. I, I, I don't know what, what it was necessarily. I'm having a bad, uh, I'm having a hard time kind of really intic- articulating it, but I feel like she's, she's just a, I, I'm really excited to actually see where they bring this character storyline. I, yeah. I mean, I, I like Tam as well. I, um, it was unexpected. Her, her personification was unexpected and that is a, an easy way to win me over uh, with any new character that you're going to throw at me is if I can't, if it was something I didn't anticipate, I will enjoy that character more uh, from the beginning. I think Kaz probably, I had too much knowledge of the character going in mm-hmm. because, you know, focus of the series and everything. But, um, yeah, I, I mean, I think Tam is just an unexpected character and a fun character uh, just because of the fact that she's a, a good foil. You know, characters are best when they can act as foils for each other. And I think she fills that role. 
No, I agree with you. The the uh, the kind of yin and yang that they create is is very fun. Yeah. Um. And I I think she's a when he when it it's just the whole team together the whole team fireball. Um. It, it, her characterization fits very well within that. And I will be really excited actually, just kind of because she is one of those characters so far, like her and Nico, Niku, where we don't really know much about it all. So I'll be kind of interested to see what the backstories are and characters like them. And and the one that really stood out to me there was Yeager, mm. who is somebody who is in the rebellion. You know, we see a picture of him having a family. I want to know what happened to that family. You know, how did he get here? How did he become this guy who kind of wants to keep his head in the sand and just keep his head down? Uh, who is a pilot himself? Who who had won all of these racing trophies but doesn't do that anymore either? Like, this guy, to me, there's so much mystery behind him. And I, he's one of the ones that I cannot wait to to learn more about. And, and honestly... um. Just the voice acting alone and the father type figure, um, I just really enjoyed him, you know, as a, as a character. In fact, uh, I actually really enjoyed his patience and his, um, I, w- I would say it's loving kindness towards uh, a character in, in Kaz who is, is kind of screwing up Yeager's life right now. You know, like he had a nice quiet life. He wasn't being bothered. He wasn't a part of any political machinations or anything. Um, and now it's kind of coming back to him in, in necess- not necessarily ways that he wants. I, and all of that, I think, just makes for a fascinating story. Yeah, I, I don't know that I can add anything to that, in, in all honesty. I, I agree that I I, um, I love the voice. Uh, it's it's really... Mm-hmm. It's got... It's really great vocal performance too. It's not just that he has a nice voice; it's that there's a great vocal performance to it. And I think that uh, just to add on to what you're saying, the fact that there's a rebellion and a racing connection almost makes me wonder if we're going to find out a Han Solo connection somewhere along the way, because we know what Han is doing during this era. That would be so awesome, man. Right? We could even get Han Solo in the series. We could. It's entirely feasible. That would be fantastic. I, I think it's doubtful, but if they're on the mm, edge of probably. wild space, and, you know, like, I, I know that there are fans who react poorly to the idea because they would think of it as, you know, a small world thinking. But if you have a character that has these connections... Han doesn't need to show up, but he could know Han easily. He could know mm-hmm. him, where he is. He could provide uh, info that way. Or you could even have something where he interacts with Leia at some point. And yep. she says, so if you talk to Han, and his response mm-hmm. is, no, I haven't seen him in a long time. You know, but so you know that there's at least something there. I mean, I'm, I know I might be getting ahead of myself and I'm not going to be disappointed if that's mm-hmm. not the case, but I just see these potential threads sitting there. I, I think that would be really cool, you know, and there were characters that we had in Bloodline as well that had also been a part of that um, racing background with Han. I think that would be really neat. The only thing that, as you were saying, you're right, when we're this close to The Force Awakens, Han is most likely with Chewie, you know, on their barge right. ship doing whatever capturing wrath tars soon or whatever so you know yeah but i i mean gosh it would just be cool to have him and chewy show up one day you know like they're just there refueling yeah yeah you could even just have him in the background yeah you know because totally. i mean looking for the falcon if anything you know uh, that yeah absolutely yeah I, see this is a character to me though uh, that I think the thing that excites me about him is Yeager's background will give us a lot of information about that time period, yeah. that 30 years. You know, so to to dig into his character is to dig into that time period. And again, I think you were absolutely right. Scott Lawrence's uh, performance as the voice is just, it's so good. It's so calming. It's so fatherly. It's so loving, disciplined when it needs to be, mm-hmm. you know, when he's dealing with Kaz and trying to teach him a lesson. But it, it's just great. Yeah, so. but he's able to he's able to put a softness in it, where you can tell that he's disciplined for a reason. That it's not because he's a, a hard or mean person. 
It's because right. he recognizes it's necessary. Yeah, no, absolutely. I mean, that's that's a really great point. Um, you know, he I, I think what what's what's kind of neat about him is he's a character who has been through a lot of things. And um the the life that he is trying to lead is because of all of those things he's been through and the things that he wants to kind of stay away from at this point. And he's having a hard time doing that because it, it's he's a little bit like, uh, he seems a little bit like, uh, you know, Michael Corleone. Every time I think I'm out, they keep pulling me back in, you know? So, um, and it's about to happen to him because, and, and this was what was fascinating too. He even says that. Um, he says, you know, if the forced order is here, then all of us are going to have to make a lot of really hard choices. Mm -hmm. uh, and I think, you know, uh, I think that's really fantastic to see him realize, obviously, that if the, if Poe is telling the truth, if this really is a, a problem, then yes, I may have to get back involved, even though that's the last thing I want to do. I think that's really cool. So... What about Niku? Uh, he <laughs> uh, some of his lines just make me chuckle now. <laughs> it, it's it's extremely cute. Um, I think that they've given themselves a lot of uh, natural comedy potential by having a yes. character who takes things literally. And you know what? I'm not ashamed to admit that. Uh, you know, the scene where Kaz distracts him by saying, I don't know, you know, what the tool is called, but it's somewhere over there. Could you get it for me? He goes, is it this one? Is it this one? Is it this one? It's not that one. Is it this one? Just the fact that he's such a, a good natured person who takes things literally, it, I think is a lot of fun. There's been a lot of natural humor already, even. It, it reminded me of Data with even less humanity in the sense of like because he he doesn't have that nuance of understanding that you're kidding and he taking everything literally i it's just it it is i i do think it is pretty funny um oh no Kaz, that is the the gentleman that we met the yesterday that you told <laughs> you were the best starfighter pilot in the galaxy he's like not now right, exactly like, and <laughs> that's that stuff's funny you know um and i kind of like it because the idea that there's a species out there that may be a more literally minded race, you know, that they may that may be part of their language. So the translation doesn't work so well in basic. Right. You know, I, I think that's funny, you know, and it's it just it's one of those things like you can you can world build in your mind then and just have a good time. And that's cool. Yeah, that's that's fun with Star Wars. So. We do have a few other characters that we kind of meet throughout this first. Um, we've got uh, Tordoza, who's one of the Starfighter pilots, and she's the daughter of the station operator, who we have not met yet. Mm -hmm. um, I do think it's kind of cool that both her and her father have um, biblical names. She's Torah, and he's Emmanuel. So that's interesting. Yeah. Um, hmm, yeah. Uh, you've got Orca, Bobby Moynihan. Um, you've got Flix. Yeah, I mean, just uh, some some great characters. I I just I love the the uh, as we were talking about that it 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 feels a lot like Deep Space Nine in the sense that you have a lot of side characters in the show yeah. who are going to show up every once in a while, um, but they're not necessarily going to be main characters. But you didn't name my favorite new character so far, aside from uh, Yeager. Bucket. Oh, I have. Oh, you really like the I, old uh, R one. I have a passion for the droids. I fell in love with Chopper immediately. I've been a lifelong R two fan. BB eight's good too, but I I actually find myself. I get why BB eight is there, right? BB eight is our right. our marquee tie in, you know, and it, it's like in the nineteen eighties, you know, you're you're spe he's like the Fonz, right? <laughs> Arthur Fonzarelli wasn't the main character, but you were watching every episode. When's Fonzie going to show up? And BB-8's like the Fonz. Yeah. That's <laughs> but but I just want BB-8 to pull out two thumbs. Hey. We know he's got one. So <laughs> that's <hey>. right. <laughs> uh, but uh, I I do I honestly um I love Bucket. Bucket is such a you know, to speak to the you know to to the the characters that take you off guard, he doesn't take me 
off guard so much as feel like the type of droid character that I've really come to love. Quirky, independent, naturally funny, and since the droid is not speaking lines that I can understand, I can still infer and go with it, you know, in, in the way that works. And I just think that um I love the quirky personality that he has. I love the you know the fact that uh that bucket wears a bucket you know wears a helmet the whole time uh i know it's weird to go on and on about a sidekick droid like that but it's the type of flavor that you know chopper helped round out if anything i would say that uh yeager and bucket are very similar i i can understand why i why i respond to them so well mm-hmm. is because they remind me of chopper and zeb they remind me of chopper and zeb and so i instantly gravitate to those sorts of characters yeah you know it's funny because i was thinking about the combination between yeager and and bucket and in many ways you know he's an he says he's a droid that was 100 years old when he bought him yeah you know so he is this ancient droid which is a lot of fun but at the same time he kind of reminds me of uh, the droid that's like the old bloodhound you know yeah like just real old yeah. and ornery, but still going. That's kind of what he reminds me of. Even his bucket even kind of has those droopy ear yeah. look to him. Yeah. And he 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 sounds old and decrepit as a droid. Like his voice is, uh, you know, it's like. <laughs> and the fact that he. You can barely understand it at all. It's great. The fact that he's willing to ram into Kaz just to. <laughs> yes. Just to, No, 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 no. He smacks him in the face with that. <laughs> yeah. That. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> the, uh, that piece of the ship that was yeah funny. yeah yeah <laughs> yeah i just i i agree with you you know i think all of these characters um that round out the the station you know they're a lot of fun and there's a lot of whimsy to them i love that you know orca is a shadra fan we finally kind of have one of those on screen like that i have no idea what f- uh, flicks is i don't think they've even named his uh, alien species yet um but again it just kind of feels it actually feels like something that would come from the animation style which we have it mm-hmm. feels like something from an anime yeah uh movie which is cool um and you know i i love um the really the only pilot we've spent any time with other than um you know the not so good friend, <laughs> the not very good friend that uh, Kaz makes is, yeah. is Tora, and I kind of love that she is like little Miss Happy Go Lucky. Um, she's just really good at what she does, but she's really nice about it, like which is yeah. is is totally different than what you expect. You expect her to be stuck up and mean and all that, and she's absolutely one hundred percent not that. And I think that makes it a lot of fun. I agree. So. I agree. It, it does make it a lot of fun, and. You know, just to speak to the design aspects, I know that the design decisions uh, of this series have been a hurdle for some fans, but I, and I'll totally cop to. I, I, you know, grew up watching Robotech. I love uh, the animation style that inspired this, so I'm, I freely admit I'm already biased toward it, but just the simple fact of the color decisions with the character outfits, um, the way that they move and interact with the environments. Uh, I, I think that this is starting from a really good place uh, with the animation. And I think that, I, I mean, I'm just a fan of this really stylized. Like I, I, I like the fact that with the animation, with all of the animation series, I can tell the era at a glance and these characters immediately belong to a different era uh, than the ones that we've gotten before. And I think that actually adds to the characters and gives us the ability here. Even if I had the sound off, I would be able to pick up who these characters are. And I think that is uh, another successful element to all of the characters on the show. I I agree that the animation style completely works with this show. You know, if if you're going to do a show you know, about ace pilots, you know, who are modding their ships to the nth degree. Mm -hmm. You know, and what's kind of fun is uh, many of these ships, the uh, remind me of the things that 
as a kid, you might take all of your, you know, if if we had Star Wars Legos back then, mm. um, you would you would have taken all of your Star Wars Lego ships and you would have put them together in your own configuration, mm-hmm. you know, and that's very much what you, I mean. It, it it really is kind of like build your own adventure starship, um, yeah. and they they build their little fighter and it looks like a combination of like 12 different ships that you've seen in star wars and that's kind of the point because they're they're trying to be the fastest in in these races and it it, the animation style really lends itself to seeing the detail without probably having as much work to do in that because it's it's all about the right shading on it Mm -hmm. it just gives it that look um but i just in the end the other thing that i notice about the animation style is that this legitimately feels like walking three and three quarter inch animated characters. Mm. Like they feel like, you know, the, like the, the toys that you would play with and these characters here feel very similar. Yeah. Uh, and so I think there's a real, it, it's smart. Um, and it just works for this show and what they're going for. And I really like it. I, I, Part of my joy of in, in watching the show has been just enjoying the animation. Um, there's a sheen to it and a shine to it that's really cool. Uh, and again, yeah, it just kind of looks like walking action figures. Yeah. Uh, which is, is pretty awesome. I mean, you know, Star Wars is is all about this that kid inside of you, and I think it really works. I, I, really, I really want some ships. I do. I want some ships to buy. Even the, uh, that, even the little die cast I, ones. I'm right there with you. That um, um, Major uh, Von Reg's uh, red tie mm-hmm. interceptor is pretty sweet. Mm. Yeah, that's it. I would really, I yeah, yeah, and I like the you know I I like the the racing ships too, and, and even the pirate ships are cool. I'm wa- I'm waiting for the Lego Fireball to come out. So. Yeah, that would be pretty awesome. <laughs> come on, get on that, guys. Yeah, oh, you know that they are. I mean, uh, Hasbro are at New York Comic Con released the line of the three and three quarter inch uh characters yay so we've already seen what those are going to look like so um now you just need the ship that those characters fit in that's right that's right so what did you think about uh oscar isaac and having poe dameron in the the first episode uh how did that end up working for you uh works well uh i think he was the right character to choose as the tie-in um because you have a built-in excuse for why Poe isn't permanently there. You know, like, I, 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 and it's recognizable enough, and frankly, you know, Poe's one of, I, I, I know I'm not alone in this, Poe's one of my favorite characters from the new trilogy. So, yeah, bring him in, by all means. Yeah, to me, seeing Oscar Isaac in this role, it was reinforcing the fact that he is so underutilized in this sequel trilogy. And honestly, I I want them to do as much with Poe as possible in this series yeah. because there's so much more to Poe. Like, the fact that he has a relationship with Jaeger is really cool. In fact, Jaeger probably knew his mom, Shara Bay, mm-hmm. who was also a pilot in the Rebellion. So, like, I would love to see more of this these kind of connections, and Poe allows you to be able to have that. And not only that, just like you said, Poe is awesome. He's my favorite character in the new um, Star Wars films. And, you know, I, I thought he was a little mistreated in, in The Last Jedi, so it's it's nice to see him here um, really get a place to shine. Mm-hmm. And um, the look that he and Leia give each other when Kaz stumbles in was pretty hysterical. Yeah, it was. Um, and I'd also like to see, you know, that gives you the opportunity to be able to build that relationship more as well. So that, you know, when you watch the films, then you really come away feeling as though Poe is in many ways Leia's right hand man. Yeah. In the in the person that she is kind of grooming to become the the next generation military leader of whatever is going to be there, you know, uh, the New Republic or, you know, obviously with everything that happens, she doesn't know, but. She she believes in Poe. She sees something in him, and I just love him in this series. Like I just I want more Poe. I have a feeling we're going to get more, but uh, probably not as much as we want. But I, I suspect he'll, you know we'll, we'll be seeing him. Uh, do we know uh, the episode schedule? Have they let us know 
how often he's going to be. On I have. I honestly haven't looked it up. Okay. Um. I know, bad fan. No, um, no, 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 no. That, that's the reason that, I so. ask. But I know that right now, obviously, they released those first three episodes, and those are then now playing out on television. And so I don't know when we actually get more episodes because they already have released three, but I don't think all three of those have played on TV yet. So yeah, it's it's an interesting place to be, isn't it? To to be in this era where we're straddling streaming show and network show, and it's going to be interesting. I think that uh, the way they handle resistance is going to be a clear indicator of where we're going to end up with um, how Disney handles you know the series that they release on their streaming app and stuff like that yeah it could be interesting because i think you know uh dc universe is just about as we're recording this is just about to start their first uh original series titans and that is releasing one episode a week Mm -hmm. so they are kind of following the tv model but it's released you know so you have time to digest it and all that kind of stuff so i'll be really interested to see how places do that um yeah. The Star Trek Discovery effect. A uh, kind of, yeah. yeah. That you want to treat it more like a classic TV show but at the same time you want to have it on your streaming service. Yeah, anyway. It's weird. Um before we know it everything's just going to be bundled in one big app. <laughs> it's going to feel like cable. Um it's just going to be, you know, right through your Apple TV. So. <laughs> yep. Uh, lastly, you know, for for us obviously Music is always a big part of Star Wars, and um, I was, I'll, I will be honest right up front, I was disappointed in the music in the show, um, it, because it's not kinder, and I can tell, and there doesn't seem to be, like, a main, the main refrain or whatever, when the, the logo comes up, just, it feels more like classic cartoon than it does Star Wars, and I just wanted them to have something that felt more Star Wars-y. Um, even if it was just like they used the Resistance, uh, you know, John Williams' Resistance theme yeah. and found a way to, to, to redo that to make the, this show. This one just felt like that could be any animated show. You know, I what I wonder is if that's on purpose uh, because I agree with you. The, the music is much more understated than we're used to. We're used to the the music having its own character, being a character in the movies and the shows. The like Williams's music, Kiner's mm-hmm. music, it is, it is its own character. This is more, I would say, uh, in a tra- to your point, traditional mindset of it's there to support the action as opposed to being a part of it. It's just the way that it fits into the puzzle. I think is just different than has been done before. So I applaud it for that, for doing something, you know, if you just give me the same thing all the time, I'm going to get bored. At least with this, this is different. Does it resonate with me as much? This, it, I, I will say, no, this hasn't had any music up to this point that makes me want to go and get a soundtrack, right? Right. I can get Kiner's music from Clone Wars and Rebels and just listen to the music and dig on it. I can get Williams' music and dig on it. I, you know, Powell, Giacchino. So I think that, and I'm only guessing here, but I would imagine that what they've done is instead of trying to compete with that, instead starting small and then they can build up from there. Is where where I'd see they're coming from. It's true. Well, it could you know it could be you know Kiner could be busy with doing the Clone Wars and just not have the time. Uh, so that could be a possibility. Um, you know, and, and heck, you know, Kiner could also not only be doing that, but he could be doing the Mandalorian too. You never know. And the thing is, this sounds dismissive, and it's not meant to be. But I'm fine with the music as it is. I'm not crazy about it. I'm not raving about it. But at the same time, I wasn't crazy about the music for Rebels at the beginning either because I thought it was too derivative. So I would almost rather, mm-hmm. I know that as the work continues, it's going to find its its own way. I like that it's starting from a different, a different way into the universe in terms of the audio landscape because it give, this feels like it's going to give me 
it's understanding I need time to warm up to it. So what you're saying is it's got to go its own way. Go its own way. I I think that that is it. I would say that you're jumping the gun if you say that it's already broken the chain because we must never break the chain, Matt. <laughs> oh man. Uh, well, you know, I don't I don't think that you I could say there's any ratings to give. No. Nah. But I guess um what are your final thoughts about just these kind of first three episodes and what impression that they end up leaving on you as you finish them? So as you look forward to, you know, what's to come with resistance, uh, the best compliment I can pay is that I was entertained. I was intrigued and I'm going to come back, you know, like this is not three episodes and, eh, you know, I'll catch it if I can. I want to see episode four. And the fact that they've created any sort of anticipation for me is a huge win. And I'm on board. You know, I, I mean, you know, we live in this, this era of polarized fandom. And I, I, I'm not sitting here saying I'll just take whatever they give me. I, it's different. It's got its own flavor. I like the characters. I like where they've started from. That's good for me. I, I'm I'm gonna give it a shot. I'm gonna I'm gonna stay with it. That's a win. No, I agree one hundred percent. You know, I, I think as we talked about, Rebels taught me a lot about coming into these shows and many times these animated shows they kind of find their their groove as they move forward, you know, and they go from being a place where it it, it feels a little bit childish, which is fine. Because that's where that's what Star Wars is, but they move towards you know more depth, and so I'm excited to see where these mysteries play and how they play out. Obviously, we know kind of where it ends with the Force Awakens, mm-hmm. but how all of these pieces play together and then where they end up going, I am excited to see. And and like you, yeah, I just I want to see the next episode. So well done, Star Wars Resistance, for making me want to see the next episode. And, uh, you know, I'm glad that you have listened to this episode of the 602 Club, and I'm really appreciative to the fact that we have amazing associate producers here through Patreon. In fact, we have a brand new associate producer, uh, Ryan Millette. I uh, want to thank him for choosing uh, to support this network through Patreon, as well as choosing the 602 Club as his place to add his mark as associate producer, along with Ken Tripp, Davis Grayson, and Dale Noah. It, uh, The fact that this show has two brand new associate producers in the last few months means so much to me, especially since we're about to hit four years at the 602 Club here. Uh, which is pretty crazy. So thank you all for listening. Um, Now, if you want the 602 Club and all of the shows to keep coming to you on Track FM, ad-free, great content every week, the best way to do that is to go to patreon.com slash trackfm where you can support us as creators and make sure all of this content keeps coming to you. Uh, And there's just no way we can do it without you. Um, We have some great contribution levels you can give at, but... And honestly, every little bit helps. So again, it's patreon.com slash trackfm. Now, Master Mills, it is just fantastic to have had you here. Uh, and um, I, I just, you know, if, if anybody wants to catch up with you and, and see how things are going, uh, you know, maybe maybe sh- share a little love on, <laughs> on the social media. Where could they find you? Uh, you know, you can find me. I'm Kessel Junkie uh, out there, usually hanging out on Twitter. Uh, and you know, that's primarily how you can get in contact with me in the social media sphere. And, uh, you can also find me, uh, co-hosting, uh, a lovely little show over on the nerd party network called aggressive negotiations, which is its own star Wars podcast. And, uh, I have a charming co-host, uh, on that show by the name of Matthew rushing. Mm, wow. Well, thank you. Yes. Goodness. Charming. <laughs> <clears throat> wow. Got to clean up my act. Um, <laughs> You can find me on Twitter, where I am cleaning up my act, at MattRushing02, um, and I'm on Instagram uh, under the same name. I'm here on the network, Chris Jones, talking about none other than Star Trek Deep Space Nine. That may have been why I referenced the show uh, a little bit during this one. Uh, you can also find me on the Nerd Party Network as well. I do a show, um, not only Aggressive Negotiations, but I do Owl Post with Drea Kaufman as we walk through every single chapter 
the Harry Potter series. And in fact, we do it one chapter at a time, and we're almost done with The Goblet of Fire. It is a great show. You can dive in anytime, anywhere. It's so much fun, so check it out. And then, last but not least, I'm doing a show called Cinema Stories with my good friend Courtney as we talk about films through the lens of faith. I just want to say thank you so much for joining us, and may the Force be with you.